<laughs> Hello, everyone. I, we're here today with Craig Johnson and Katie Sackoff and Lou Diamond Phillips. I, we fell in love with the writing of Craig Johnson with his first book. And when we opened our bookstore in way back when Craig's first, second book came out, he was one of the uh, two authors that we invited to that store to begin, uh, begin the store. One was Craig and the other was Pam Houston, and I love them both. And Craig has been so incredibly loyal to our store. He comes every year uh, to do uh, an on-site event, and we just have a blast. It's a lot of fun in, in person. And once we're out of COVID, if y'all want to come to uh, Sun River, we're planning to do it again, aren't we, Craig? We are. So absolutely. I'm going to turn you know it over. I used to come on the Outlaw Tour after the National Tour on the motorcycle. Mm -hmm. They used to do a great big 5,000 mile loop, like at you know, where I take off out of U-Cross, go up through Montana, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, back through Utah, and then back in through into Wyoming. Like a, on a uh, motorcycle? Uh, yep, on a motorcycle. <laughs> the big uh, GS, like at one of those BMW GS, uh, you know, dual sports. <laughs> Next time you do that, invite me. You, were the, you, you thought you were the only one that had a motorcycle? <laughs> How many motorcycles do you have? Just out of curiosity. Only two right now. Only two. Oh, okay. You show restraint. You show restraint. I got four. So, so Craig, do you remember back when we had the, the big community hall that was right across from the store back when we were? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I do remember you that. You rode yeah. the motorcycle in and you sat on the it with Flashman and the dog. A, that's a tradition with cowboys, you know, to ride your horse into the bar like that, you know, or, you know ride the motorcycle into the event center. I guess that would be the modern day version of that, I guess. Like that. So I'm sure Lou's done it. Lou's done that stuff before. Like, it. Lou, do you have a motorcycle? Have you ever? No, you know? I just look like I should. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's you know, kind of been an image thing for my entire life. I mean, you know, I swear to God, after Longmire, even Yvonne, you know, it's just, millions of people out there think you wear flannel all the time. <laughs> you wear Hugo Boss, for God's sakes. <laughs> you know? So uh, yeah, it's an image thing. <laughs> I think Judy was asking me about that. Like, cause she's like, well, now Katie has a motorcycle. Like, and I'm like, yeah, I'm, you know, she's like, do you think Lou has them? I'm like, I'm sure he must like a military background, Texas guy. Come yeah, on. You've got to have a motorcycle. Car either. <laughs> so probably Yvonne put her foot down and said, no way. You're not, you have children and there's no way like that. So, you know, yeah. Uh, so funny. Sorry, sorry for that tangent there, Dion. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> You're doing grand. Uh, I do want to mention that I'm wearing the red pony hat from uh, Lou Diamond as uh, Henry Standing Bears, and Richard is showing another hat. He's waving it out here. <laughs> so y'all can get these hats at craigallenjohnson.com as well as the shirt, but I'd have to kind of lower the camera to show you the shirt, so wearing it isn't going to work. But um, Lots of good stuff. CraigAllenJohnson.com and uh, Judy Johnson will take good care of you. So there's my <laughs> beautiful commercial day message for the day. Continual soiree. Yeah. <laughs> I do. I've got it. See? Right there. So, so Craig, do you want to uh, say a few words about our illustrious uh, co-panelists here? Well, this is, you know, I mean, this is, it's been, it's been kind of interesting like that because obviously, everybody's lives have changed, you know, so much like it. And uh, it, one of the things they asked me was, they said, you know, I think when they did the, the tour for set up, Viking Penguin basically said, we're not touring any authors until 2021. Like we're going to close it all down and not do anything until January. And so pretty much I wasn't going to be doing a tour at all. Like, and then they, they said, well, how about virtual touring? Like, and I was like, okay, yeah, I'm game for anything. Like, and they said probably about five or six events stretched over a two week period. And I was like, what? <laughs> And they said, yeah, you know, we don't want to, you know, tire out the viewers. You know, we think, you know, that, you know, they're, they're you know, they, once you get on there and you talk a couple of times, like at the viewership, you know, we'll probably drop down a little bit. And I said, yeah, I got some friends, I think, that might be able to help me out with that, actually, when you get right down to it. Like that. And uh, so uh, I, I asked, you know, everybody if they would be willing, like at first of all, I asked them if they would be willing to do some readings. Um, from uh, the next to last stand, the newest book, like it, and everybody was so gracious. And then I, I pushed it even a step further, like it, and asked if they would be willing um, to go live, like it, and do some of these events with me, like it. And by golly, it was once again a, a resounding response, like it, and uh, pretty wonderful, I have to admit. 
And uh, we've had a grand time. And this is our final event. This is our grand finale here, like that. And uh, I know that uh, with the, the scheduling that everybody's got, like I know how busy they are and what all they have to go through, like that. And so this kind of is a, a wonderful uh, thing, like that, for both Katie and for Lou, like that, to, to be a part of. Like that. Robert's going to be a part, um, but you know, he sometimes has some trouble with the technology all the way down there from Australia. And uh, we're, we're coming from both coasts. I get Lou Diamond Phillips coming to us from Manhattan, um, where if he broadened open the scope of his, his image here, you would see probably five different cats uh, mm -hmm. laying on him at different uh, points of repose like that. Um, Katie Sackoff, the lovely Katie Sackoff, is joining us from Vancouver, where she's on a shoot like that. And uh, you, somebody was there in your lap. Is that somebody still in your lap like that? Or is it, aha. Oh, this is happy. <laughs> Is that a co-star? Is that a co-star or is that, uh, is that, oh, okay, okay. You're a co-star with the, <laughs> in that show. He's got separation anxiety, so we always <laughs> have to come to laugh. So cute. <laughs> so anyway, it's wonderful to have everybody here. Like that. And um, yeah, this is the tour for the 16th book in the Walt Longmire series, uh, Next to Last Stand. Like that. And uh, it's really kind of wonderful to have be doing it here at Sun River. Um, which is a, a store that I've done over and over again like that and uh, an absolutely gorgeous location too. It's a beautiful spot. Like I always enjoy um, the motorcycle rides, especially like I, cause I was able to come down the coast like that, you know, whenever you get uh, out of Washington and head into Oregon like that and drop down like that, you know, from uh, whenever I do the events up at Powell's like at Cedar, uh, Cedar Hills um, and then go over the mountains like that. And it's a beautiful, beautiful area. Like that. And then, and then head East like that, you know, and, uh, Eastern Oregon looks remarkably like Wyoming. There's a, a very strong resemblance um, between the two. Like if they ever decide that they're gonna start filming more Longmire and they decide to not do it in New Mexico, I'm thinking maybe Eastern uh, Oregon might be a, a good spot too. I guess we never know. And also, I don't know, does anybody, does everybody know that, that Katie is, a, an, or a, a, is an Oregon native? Um, and you, you evidently, you know, other than Katie, who knows obviously a lot about that, you know a little bit about it, Dion. You had uh, some connections there who uh, had, uh, oh. had, had, had some sort of interaction with Katie at some point there. All of our customers know that Katie is an Oregonian and they, they <laughs> claimed her for one of their own when uh, she was cast. And uh, um, one of our customers was had Katie as a babysitter and thought she was a fine babysitter indeed, and and was just <laughs> over the moon that she was cast. And, and <laughs> I, I love that time change. Time just softens memories. <laughs> I don't think I was a good babysitter at all. I feel like those children are alive by sheer by sheer grace of God. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Katie, you outdid me, though, because I only babysat once in my life. I'm not real good with that kind of thing. Ambulances were involved. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Thanks. So, I never burned any houses down, thank God. I actually have done that, too. So, <laughs> um, shall, shall I hit into some of the questions people have for you? You can, you can. Um, we also have a, we have a video too, don't we? Like we have a we video. We do. Do you want to see the video first? Um, I don't know. I mean, because then it, it, it'll be kind of interesting like that because I don't think Katie or Lou have, uh, this is actually Zahn McLaren's uh, video. Oh, very cool. Um, it's the one that he did like it. And so it might be fun like that for everybody to, to, to see it. It's actually a scene that takes place. Um, I'm pretty sure this one's up at the little Bighorn battlefield too. It's not too long after uh, the scene that Lou um, did the reading for it, like that. And, uh, you know, it just, it's been such a blast to hear everybody read like that. And I, I know Lou's probably tired of hearing me saying it like that, but, you know, we're used to these guys doing dialogue and everything like that, but to hear them, you know, read narrative like that and do, you know, a couple of pages where you're able to just fall into their voices, like at the performances have just been remarkable. Like that. they've just been really, really remarkable. Like that. And even though Zahn was not able to join us, because he's also on, uh, on, on site. And I saw some, some video of him uh, petting wolves. I don't know what that was involved with like that, but he was petting wolves on Facebook. Like, and I'm not sure. I don't know if I know, if I want to know like what that's about. Like that, but, was he uh, dancing with uh, them? 
I don't think he was dancing. I don't know. Maybe he was. I mean, that's that's that kind of dancing. I don't understand. So, you know, maybe he was. I don't know. But uh, but yeah, this is uh, this is actually a scene that takes place up on the Little Bighorn battlefield between Walt and Henry and Vic. So, yeah. so I've got good news and bad news on the clip. Okay. Uh, the good news is I have it. I have it ready to load up. The bad news is when I was practicing this. Remember, I'm new to vib uh, webinars, so my technological skills not that great. Um, <laughs> I couldn't get back on. Remember when I couldn't get back on earlier? So I was thinking we would do the, the uh, clip at the very end. Yes, absolutely. I lose got, okay, the, the two pros downstairs. Did, are you, when, that's when you see this, right? Like when you're doing something live, like, you know, stretch it out, stretch it out, talk, talk, keep talking. Like, so so certainly, I, I I'm happy to. I'm happy to. With the clip. And, uh, and I could. Uh, throw you your questions now, and I can see we're getting some from audience too. So we'll look. Sure, it looks like we got a huge yep. crowd. Like, if you want to start in with the the, the audience questions, that's fine. Well, I was going to give you a couple from our customers. Okay. So, uh, and and I've got a couple uh, for Katie and uh, Lou too. I bet. So, uh, actually, these go to you. Uh, this is the number one question. So I threw our customers coming through. I was asking them uh, if they had questions for you guys. Number one question was, is there going to be a new series or movie? And it must have the same cast. And I'm going to just read you my favorite of the questions that came this way. This is from Sylvia Van Noy. Um, and Sylvia uh, was, is one of Craig's and the series' best fans uh, and most ardent supporters. So I'm just reading you her question part, not all the stuff where she says that Craig is wonderful. But she says a lot of that. Um, she says, and like all your other fans, Craig, we would love to see a movie, Longmire, come out. The seasons went far too quickly, and even though most of us have watched it many times, we are still hungry for more. And if it can't be another season of Longmire, then we will be happy to have a movie, Longmire. With one provisio, though, it would have to be the same cast as the series. The cast is so awesome and such a wonderful fit for the characters that we need them to do the movie, especially since we have all grown to love them so much in the series and on Facebook and Twitter. Anyone who died in the series would have to make at least one of, uh, at least a few appearances in the movie, such as in a dream. So my question is, when can we hope the movie will come out? So there we go. That's from Sylvia Van Noy. Okay. Okay. I got, well, I mean, these guys will probably find out about it faster than I will. Um, but I guess the, 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 the biggest hope that we've heard so far, I mean, one of the misnomers is that the people think we got canceled. We really didn't get canceled. Like we just didn't sell, you know, ourselves to somebody else. Um, the TV show was actually made by Warner brothers. Like, and so then when it was uh, on A&E, um, for the three years, like we were the highest rated scripted drama that A&E had ever had. And so they wanted to buy the show from Warner Brothers and Warner Brothers wouldn't sell the show. And so A&E said, well, we're gonna stop doing the show, which they did. Um, and then we got picked up immediately. And I remember talking with Peter Roth um, at Warner Brothers, like, and I remember him, I said, well, where do you think we're gonna land? And he said, well, I think we're probably gonna land with this streaming service. Like, and I said, what do you mean a streaming service? And he goes, well, it's where, you know, you can watch TV shows and movies, you know, on your phone and on your computer. And I was like, oh, that's it, we're dead. We're just dead in the water then. Like, well, that was Netflix. Like, so obviously I'm a moron. And if I give you any stock tips during the course of the next hour, you should avoid them completely. Like, um, so uh, yeah, we got picked up by Netflix. Like, we're one of the top 20 shows on Netflix, you know, for three years. Like, and then we were victims of our own success again. Netflix came to Warner Brothers and said, we want to buy the show. And Warner Brothers said, no, we didn't sell it to A&E. We're not going to sell it to you. And they were a little more gracious about it, like that, and allowed us, like, to finish up that third, have a third season to kind of wrap things up a little bit. But uh, I guess the, the thing that I see that's, you know, probably the most um, hopeful um, in this whole process is uh, Warner Brothers announced last year that they're going to start doing their own streaming service. Um, Paramount's already got one. CBS is doing one. ESPN, all the others everybody's kind of jumping on board with the idea of doing these streaming networks. Well, it would be kind of foolish for Warner Brothers to not think about, you know, maybe resurrecting the sheriff and crew um, for that kind of an opportunity. And the, 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 the performers that we have, like, it's really kind of wonderful like that because they're in demand. Um, and the two down here, uh, right here, are like two that are in the most demand. 
like that. And uh, what, what we're hoping for is the possibility that we would be able to do some, you know, TV movies where we could bring everybody in, you know, for a two or three week period like that. And then that way they would be released and be able to go and continue doing the work that they're doing now like that, but uh, also to do some, uh, some Longmire movies. So we'll see what happens. And as far as I know, that's what information I have. I don't know what have information you guys might have. Though. <laughs> No, I, you know, I agree with you. I mean, I, I know that, you know, I think everybody, uh, everybody would be game 100%, uh, you know, and it's up to the powers that be. And, and uh, you know, with everybody sort of uh, expanding into their own streaming world, you're right. I mean, there's a hunger for content and they have something that they already know uh, is successful and has a built-in audience. So that, that, that would obviously make a lot of sense. And I think uh, for all of our lives, I mean, especially Kitty and I are on other shows right now. Uh, you know, and Zahn, Zahn blew up. God bless him, man. I'm so happy for him. Uh, but uh, uh, a, a movie, you know, a streaming movie would make a lot of sense because we could get in and get out, you know, and, and do our thing. And I've, I've said this a million times, you know, uh, the, the series was wonderful, but, but they never really touched some of the plots of your books. And some of those books are tailor made, so to speak, <laughs> you know. For, yeah, for, for movies, for a, a, a massive movie treatment. By the way, I, 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 I see you, Katie. I see, whenever I read the books now, I see all of us. And, and, it's, and it's wonderful because, you know, in, in the first half dozen that I read, and I've read them all, I think, except one, uh, uh, you know, it, it took me a while to even see myself in that role. But uh, now, now, man, they, you know, we'd all go on the warpath if they tried to, you know, get the younger versions of us. Oh, absolutely. I would not be the one to tell a single cast member that they were not invited back. I, I value my life much more than that. Like, no <laughs> I'd go, I'd go Vic on them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't do that. <laughs> so uh, the next question, um, there, there, as I say, are a couple from our customers in the store was, uh, with the title being the next to the last stand, will there be only one more Walt Longmire or will there be more? Oh, it, no. That, that, that's just, uh, that was just me being funny like that, you know, with the, the, the Little Bighorn battle. Um, and whenever I, I, you know, because like the Little Bighorn is only like about maybe 90 minutes up the road from where my ranch is. And uh, it's kind of like, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, you don't go there unless you have visitors come in. It's like, you know, when you're in L.A., you don't go to the Santa Monica Pier unless you've got family who comes in. And you don't go to the Statue of Liberty in New York unless, you know, you have family who comes in. Like, well, our family who comes in, you take them up and you take them up to the Little Bighorn like that. But uh, it's, a, it's a unique kind of place. You know, it's uh, uh, an epic, you know, point in American history. Like, and I think it kind of has a resonance you know, for, you know, what's going on in the country now as far as race relations, like it, and how that's dealt with in so many ways, like it, and uh, it was just a question of like, when it was I was going to attempt to try and climb that mountain was what it was going to be like that, because it's one of those, um, you know, one of those aspects of Western history that is kind of a, a rabbit hole that you can fall down into. Um, I, I do laugh about it, you know, because, you know, my access point was Cassili Adams's painting, you know, the, the, the you know, Custer's Last Fight. And it's been funny like that because uh, there's an episode in Longmire in the first season, I think it's the second or third episode, where the painting is actually a subplot, you know, to one of the episodes. And it's been funny like that because whenever the book, you know, title came out, a lot of people contacted me and said, well, did you get the idea you know, from the episode of the television show. And I was like, no, I was doing the research for this book eight years ago. Like, that, you know, there are some books that are just, you know, a lot more, you know, uh, um, research oriented like that. And so I knew that if I was going to try and take this on, I was going to have to try and make sure that I got the information and, and got it right. Like, I mean, you know, they're, you know, the books are translated into 20 some languages. And, you know, I don't want people quoting from my books like that or, you know, saying things that aren't correct. You know, it's kind of important to me to make sure that I get it and get it right. Um, and this one was one that was, you know, very technologically, uh, you know, it was going to take a lot of work, a lot of research to make sure that I got this one done right. And uh, the one thing I can say honestly is, is that uh, with all the books I've read and all that, there are a lot of really bad Custer books out there, I got to admit. Like that. And uh, the only thing that can give them a run for their money is the amount of Custer movies that are out there that are really, really bad. Like that. Um, one of my favorite scenes is uh, is actually the uh, one of the scenes that uh, I guess Jeffrey uh, De, De Serrano actually did the reading of, like, and it's in the bar where Vic and Walt and Henry are all watching um, They Died With Their Boots On, 
which my buddy Marcus Red Thunder up on the res refers to as they died with their facts wrong. Um, and it's, you know, it, it's an Errol Flynn movie that's just horrendous. Like, it, it bears absolutely no resemblance to the reality, you know, of the, of the battle whatsoever. And so, for me, that was kind of the, 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 you know, the attempt to try and, like, make it relevant and uh, try and, like, you know, try and make it right, try and make sure I got it right. Okay, so uh, question number, there's only two more from the customers. So, uh, <laughs> question number three, and we have a lot of people, uh, uh, asking this one as well and this comes from uh pam anderson one of your big fans she's usually in the front row you'll notice pam a uh, beautiful blonde woman in the front and she said it's just so sad that can't, craig can't be in sun river this year hopefully he'll have a new book next fall and we can all gather in one place in sun river she wants to know if you're coming back to sun river so do i absolutely. are you absolutely Go. in a heartbeat <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I, number one, yes, there is another book. Okay, there's another book called uh, Daughter of the Morning Star, which I'm working on now, like that. And uh, it's, uh, it's I, I've been fortunate enough to join my buddy, uh, Tiger Scalp Cane, like at Marcus, up on the res, like that. And, uh, you know, girls basketball on the res is fierce. It is ferocious. Um, as a matter of fact, in 1922, the Fort Shaw uh, girls basketball team, like that, uh, up in Montana, went to the World's Fair and defeated every other team in America and were basically the national champions. Like, and so it's a, it's a fierce game they play like it up there. And uh, one of the issues, you know, I, I kind of try and write, you know, socially responsible crime fiction in the sense I'm you know, trying to get a message across, you know, whenever I'm writing one of the books. And one of the, you know, big issues that's happened, especially in Indian country right now, is the number of, um, of Native women who have been abducted or disappear. Uh, simply disappear. And um, it's an issue that I've, I've wanted to try and take on like that. But then having an issue is one thing, but then you need to have an access point. You need to have something, a story or a plot that will illustrate that, you know, and be, uh, you know, strong enough, you know, to carry a novel like that. And I think I found one. And in this book, you know, of course, you know, Walt, you know, has faced some really dangerous situations before. And this time he's on a bus, you know, with a um, an entire team of teenage girl basketball players, you know, and he's, he's been up against some really tough situations before, but nothing to prepare him for this. This is, this is going to be really rough for the sheriff. I got a sneaking suspicion. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> Always rough on that sheriff. <laughs> I'm, just picturing, I'm just picturing Rob on a bus you. on her phone and talking about boys and like ready to just jump out. Yep. Yeah, it, you're, you're getting the right picture. You're getting the idea, <laughs> you're the correct idea of this. Like, okay, you really are. I love that. So. I love that. Poor, poor Henry is responsible for keeping him sane throughout the entire book. Okay, so it I should be that. interesting. Like, so. Well, he lets him get right up to the edge, always. Always <laughs> has to get right up to the edge, and then he'll grab him by his belt loops, you yep. know? Yeah, pull it back. Like that, so. <laughs> and Henry played on a, uh, a championship team. Like, he played in a Ooh. championship, uh, an, a, a, a Montana championship team. Like, that, so. It's his game and not Walt's. You know, Walt really, you know, just doesn't understand basketball and doesn't get it. Uh, he's a football player, right? Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's kind of difficult for him to kind of get the hang of things. Okay, so. Yeah. Okay, question number four. And then I've got a couple for Lou and Katie too. Um, this comes from Clark Peterson. And he says, with 16 books under your belt for the Longmire series, do you get concerned about running out of ideas for new adventures? And where do your plots come from? Never, I never. I'm gonna die before I get them all written. That's the problem. Like that. I mean, you know, the dirty little secret is the majority of all of my books all come from newspaper articles. Um, everywhere I go, you know, I'm gathering up. You know, when I'm passing through Oregon, I'm grabbing, you know, some of those small town newspapers, like at Out in Burns, and you know, the smaller towns and everything like that, because it kind of gives a little bit of an idea of you know what these rural sheriffs are kind of you know dealing with and what they're doing. And and I'm always like you know grabbing those, cutting out the clippings putting them in a file folder, like it, and got them for later. Like, I've got a file folder that's like about, you know, about a foot thick um, with all of the issues and dealings like that that I'm gonna, you know, trying to turn into. One thing I did do like that was that up until like about, you know, I guess, you know, three years ago, I took all of those newspaper articles and made, you know, photocopies and actually sent them, you know, and gave them, you know, to the producers. And by golly, they used almost every single one of them. Um, so you're going to see little shadows, you know, lingering in the books, you know, as we go on for hopefully another 20, 30 years. I've, I've got great hopes. Okay, so. Sounds good to me. 
Okay, so for Lou, you have got a new book coming out on October 20th. We're all excited about that. You want to tell us all a little about your new book? Sure. It's called uh, The Tinderbox Soldier of Indira. Uh, they asked me to put that subtitle on the book because it is actually uh, uh, inspired from uh, The Tinderbox by Hans Christian Andersen. Uh, and so, you know, to, to differentiate the two when you're Googling it, I guess. Um, but uh, uh, the actual original inspiration for the, for the book uh, came from my wife, Yvonne. And when we first met, we were getting to know each other. Uh, she was reading a lot of my writing. And I was looking at some of her artwork, which is just amazing. And her go-to style is a German woodcut kind of style, very old-fashioned. She grew up in Germany, and her grandmother used to tell her stories. And she's a big fan of Hans Christian Andersen, big fan of Grimm, uh, Grimm's fairy tales. And, you know, she would, she would illustrate these. She would draw them. Um, but she had an, another set of drawings that were manga. They were like the beginning of, uh, you know, an anime kind of uh, graphic novel. And these were inspired from the tinderbox. But when I saw them, I saw a post-apocalyptic sort of adventure story. And I went, we should make a movie. So fine. She said, great, write it. And so, you know, this is something that I've done. I think I've you know, I had four or five screenplays produced. And so I wrote the screenplay. And when I finished the screenplay, I went, well, shit, this is far too expensive. Nobody's going to give me this much money to direct it. So, you know, my manager uh, said, well, write the novel, man. You, you always thought you would, you know, do something like that. So write the novel, kind of create the world and, and uh, you know, have total authorship over it. And, um, and that's what I did. I mean, it took a number of years, a number of years to do uh, because my day job kept working out. You know, I, I kept kind of acting. Uh, and so I kind of write on the side. Um, and it was, I think, second or third season of Longmire that I, I got the, the cojones up to, uh, to ask Craig to read it, read the first one or two chapters or something. And, you know, tell me if I was wasting my time. I mean, let me down easy. But, you know, go, son, you know, this ain't your thing. You know, I was open to him saying that. And uh, he, he read the first, uh, first couple of chapters. And so did Judy. And, you know, God bless them. They, they were so supportive, so encouraging. Uh, they really, they, they're, they're the reason I finished it, you know, and uh, uh, could, could not be more grateful. And then now that the whole thing became its own animal and, and uh, they tell me it's YA, they tell me it's a sci-fi, it's fantasy, Game of Thrones meets Star Wars meets Romeo and Juliet in space. Uh, okay, you know, whatever category you guys want to put it in, that's fine with me. Uh, but then Yvonne had to go back and... Uh, um, do brand new illustra illustrations for the book. And she's done like 30 illustrations and she will forever hold it against me because there was more than one time going, I don't draw spaceships. I don't do sci-fi <laughs> shit. I, I do fairy tales, you know? And, uh, but she finally, she, she, man, I, she, she met the challenge and she's done some very, very cool illustrations. Well, it will be carried in our store. And uh, one of uh, Craig's tour of duty people, uh, also, when they signed up for Craig's event, they asked us to order the book for, you, for them. So we're sending it off to someone that Craig sold your book to, basically. Okay. Uh, and I think we're, we're, we're trying to figure out a way to get, get them all signed if, if people are interested in signed hardcover copies. Uh, but oh, yeah, it comes out, awesome. yeah, it comes yeah. out October 20th, not only in hardcover, but on Kindle, you know, ebook, and also the audiobook. Uh, and I'm actually very impressed. I'm kind of feeling like a big deal now because I got some street cred. Uh, the audiobook is being done by uh, R.C. Bray, who uh, award-winning uh, narrator of The Martian, and Julia Whelan, also an award-winning uh, um, uh, female narrator. Uh, and, and what I love about it is that, uh, unlike Craig's books, which are all first-person, I jump perspective to a lot of the different characters. So Bob Bray does the, the male point of view, and Julia does all of the female point of view chapters. And so I thought it was, it, it was great to have uh, input from both of them. Sounds good. Yeah. And the next and last one before we jump to audience questions is for Katie and Lou both. And that comes from a compilation of questions that the people at, in the store have asked. And that is that these characters are so alive to all of Craig's readers. I mean, they, they really, uh, to me, they feel like good friends. I always look forward to a new uh, book and I find that in the new book um, that we have Vic in very good trim in the new book. <laughs> um, so they wanted to know, have 
playing, was it, was it difficult to step into the roles of these characters who are already strongly in the minds of, of Craig's readers? And also, has playing these characters had any effect on you personally? And that goes particularly to you, Katie, because you have the most out of control of Craig's characters. <laughs> it was based, by the way, on his wife, who I love. <laughs> Judy is just one of the world's good people. I know. I think that that was one of the things that were that was most um, daunting in playing the character. Is just, you know, I know that that, that physically I didn't look like Vic, um, and so I know that that when people first saw that I was playing the role, that was the thing that people really, you know, sort of like touched on and were sort of disappointed by. But I think that by you know reading the script and, and reading Craig's first book and sort of like listening to, you know, I didn't know that it was based on Judy until after. <laughs> um, and so I think that, I think that maybe I might just be a little like Judy. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I think I might just have a little Vic in me. I think, you know, Vic is the closest I've ever played to myself. Um, so <laughs> I think that it just, that's sort of how it happened. <laughs> so I don't think she rubbed off on me. I actually don't think I swear as much as Vic does, um, but I think I did when I started playing her, but I've had to slowly pull back on the swearing because um, I have like a, a younger audience now as well. And so I started having to watch the things that come out of my mouth. So still comes very easily though. <laughs> I, I can attest to the fact that, uh, yeah, you were pretty salty back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> you know, eternally, you know, entertaining to me. You know, I loved it, you know. <laughs> you, you, and I, you and I have had some very interesting conversations that we cannot repeat now, you know. So, very true. But, you know, I always felt like you were the essence. You were absolutely the essence of Vic to me. I mean, the, to me, the, the really, I mean, the hair color, who cares? You know, I mean, it's, you, you really just... Uh, to me, I mean, from from Jump Street, nailed her, man. I thought I thought it was fantastic, just so good, you know. I think but it I mean, also helped that Rob was such a physical presence. You know, I think that had it, because he made me look smaller. He made me look dinkier, um, for lack of a better term. Yeah, but you me know, too. I, <laughs> so I, I think that it helped me sort of embody Vic more because he was actually bigger as well. So like the, you know, the scene from the pilot episode when he picks me up and carries me away, there's not a ton of actors that would have been able to actually do that. Um, and so I think that it made, he made me come across closer to Vic than I actually probably am in Craig's mind when he was writing her. Well, there's the physicality like that you always look at it. And, and I guess a lot of people get caught up in things like hair color and things like that, like that. But um, one thing I learned, you know, very early on, like that when they were doing the casting for Longmire is, is that acting ability trumps everything else. If somebody walks in and they give an, inter they give a, an audition and they blow everybody into the weeds like that, then guess what? You know, they're going to get that role as simple as that. Like that That's the way it's supposed to work. Yeah, yeah. Like, and, and fortunately for us, it did. Like that, you know, I mean, that was the, the amazing thing. Like, that, I mean, you know, the, the, I remember that, that when they asked me about the character of Vic, like that, I said, the only thing I'm asking you to do is please do not get some, you know, five, six foot tall, 100 pound, you know, model slash actress, you know, and four inch heels and an Armani suit, you know, please do not do that. Get somebody who looks physical, like they can actually do what it is, you know, that we're going to ask this character to do and what she does. And, and that's what's so great about Katie is that she's got that great physical build. She looks like she can handle herself. No two ways about it. Now, there is, there is an opposite side to that too, like that, because I've seen a lot of it happen. Like that, because Katie looks the way she does, a lot of people, you know, I think miss just how incredible of an actress she is. Like, that, I mean, my God, when you watch some of those scenes, it just is stunning. Like that, I mean, that scene in the hospital, you know, where you start to touch Walt's back, like that, and then pull back and don't do it. Oh my gosh. Like that, I mean, there's just, you know, it, it just an incredible performance, you know, from one end of the of the show all the way through to the other, in my opinion. So we have, you know, beautiful subject material and beautiful writing and and directors that trusted us to sort of 
embody the characters and do what they hired us to do. You know, it, there was just the right amount of input and then they let us do what we do, which is beautiful and rare. Mm. I have to admit that when I was reading Next to Last Stand, and don't give the end away because I am 10 pages from the end. I would be at the end now because I stayed up until the wee hours reading it, except that I've been sending the links to the people that want to uh, watch this in the wee hours too. Um, but when I was reading Next to Last Stand, uh, there's a lot of Vic in the sto story, and I kept seeing you, Katie. So. <laughs> and there is a lot of, uh, of uh, Henry in the story, too. And Henry is having a good time in this one. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, I, 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 I have to admit, I, I, I blush a little sometimes when I read Craig's, you know, thing, because I put myself in there and I thought, Oh, Henry is quite the ladies' man. <laughs> okay, you know, maybe back in the day, way back in the day, I had three women fighting over me, but uh, no, no, not oh, really. Brother. Oh, oh brother. You're, you're holding up just fine. Do not worry, Lou. You are holding up just fine. Yeah. But no, I mean, I, I, and I love that, you know, the, I love the whole discussion about why, why Henry has a tux in, in his trunk. <laughs> You know, I thought that was just six lines. What are you, formal man? In case a prom breaks out, you know, like a James Bond of the Res. I thought that was so fantastic. <laughs> uh, uh, and once again, showing just yet another side of, of uh, you know who Standing Bear is, because a lot of people can can make assumptions and think they know everything about him, and you know he's like an onion. <laughs> oh yeah, no. Bag. He's got layers. No, it's more no. like a rose. So different. Yeah. 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 Parfait. Everybody like parfait. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember, Lou, the first time that you read one of Craig's sex scenes between Vic and Walt, and you literally, I think you called me. I, I think <laughs> I, <laughs> but I remember I you. What happened? <laughs> Guess what's going to happen? I, 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 I think this is going to happen. <laughs> and you were like, no, 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 no. <laughs> You know. Craig writes his sex scenes like Harlequin, like romance novels. <laughs> yes. Makes the it happened in Philadelphia, and she comes out in a robe and a man. <laughs> you, know, you know, you you know what you know what Craig has on his ranch? Brown chicken, brown cow, brown chicken, brown cow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm always leave something to the reader's imagination like that. Always, you know, leave a little something, you know, for them to have input like that, you know, so, you know, that's important to me. Like it, so. Exactly. <laughs> Oh, that scared so me to death, though. I have to admit that that was uh, the first sex scene that was in uh, Kindness Goes Unpunished. Uh -huh. And uh, it's, it scared me to death like that. But, you know, I, I, I have to admit, uh, that, you know, Whenever, you know, you guys are outlaws too, like that. I mean, you know, whenever somebody gives you a law or a rule, the first thing you start thinking is, how can I get around that? You know, and so whenever, you know, I first started out, you know, all of the other authors, you know, were giving me advice and they were saying, oh yeah, you can have sexual tension between the characters, but you can't have anything happen for like 17 or 18 books. And my immediate response to that was, what kind of women are you dating <laughs> that would wait 17 or 18 years for something to accidentally happen, really? And so I thought, let something happen. All it's going to do is complicate their relationship. All it's going to do is make it more interesting and have more layers, you know, as to what's going on between them. And, uh, and it worked out. It worked out. I think the key element, though, was as I switched their responses, um, you know, Vic has, you know, Walt has the very much, you know, the whenever something like this happens between close friends or coworkers, you know, Walt has the more standard, you know, female response where he says, you know, that was a big mistake. And we are never going to do that again. That's never going to happen again. And Vic, on the other hand, has the more standard male response, which was, that was great. And we are definitely doing that again, okay? <laughs> Just so you know. Okay. And uh, it, it doesn't seem to have slowed down the, 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 the sale of the books. I think you know, most people actually look forward to it, you know, if anything. So. so on that note, <laughs> um, let's move on to see what uh, we've got a bunch of questions down here from the audience. So. Uh, let's see. Um, so uh, the first question up there uh, comes from Kathy Ray, who wants to know, Katie and Lou, hi, great to see you. What were the physically hardest scenes for you to do? Katie? Physically hardest. 
you want to tell you, oh, okay, for um, me, you know what? No, I was just, I was just I know, even I know what Lou's answer is going to be. Yeah. Oh, you know what? Well, yeah, there, there, there are a few. I mean, you know, getting strapped down in the desert, you know, in early March uh, in, uh, you know, in Santa Fe <laughs> is never any fun. Uh, you know, shirtless, no, no, no less. You know, so that 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 was not uh, comfortable in the least. Um, but yeah, I mean, the one the one that I, I really I think was um, probably the most difficult fight scene I've ever done. Maybe you know, was was that fight scene with with freaking Taylor on the the uh, the runway when uh, A Martinez, uh, you know, when Night Horse's uh, uh, plane is coming in, and it was the first day of shooting for me, and. People don't realize, you know, that, that haven't been to the region. Santa Fe is, what, 9,000 feet? 9,000 feet above sea level? So if you get there a week ahead of time or something like that, you're still not acclimated. And uh, uh, Chris Chulak, God love him, a uh, wonderful, wonderful director, directed so many of our episodes, directed the pilot. Um, he's very much a cinema verite guy. He did Southland. He did ER. So he loves long takes. And Katie knows this from doing a lot of physical stuff herself. As actors, we're used to breaking up the fight scenes, you know, all right, we're going to do like a 30 second, you know, moment here. You know, he goes from top to bottom every single time. And me trying to hold Taylor's arms back, climb up on top of Taylor. I, it was like, it was like wrestling the, the bastard child of a grizzly bear in an oak tree. You know, it, it, I, it, it killed me. I'm telling you, man. And after like the fourth take, I'm looking pretty peaked, and and Chris Howell, our our stunt coordinator, comes over and goes, "Need a little oxygen, Lou?" <laughs> no, you know, and me, you know, young freaking gun. Go, no, no, man, I'm good. I'm good. No, no, because no, I'm not suggesting actually. You need some oxygen. <laughs> so they, you know, they put me on the freaking mask, and uh, you know, uh, and then after I caught my breath, right back at it. But uh, that was uh, that was an afternoon from hell. Uh, I and and it was cold. And so I must have soaked in Epsom salts for about two hours that night. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Do you have one, Katie, or do you want me to go on to the next? No, I, you know, I, I think that there's so many that, that were hard. You know, the, the elements of New Mexico were a definite strain on, on us physically. So there's a lot of scenes where I was cold or hot or, you know, I mean, there's so many of those. And then there's, you know, the physicality of doing the, the um, when she did the reservation race, that was, that was hard too, because it was actually physical and I was doing the race and, and, um, but I don't really know. There was this, um, scene in the pilot that was cut actually where i had to take down a guy and they didn't put it in and i don't i don't know why the guy was like seven feet tall it was insane he was like the biggest dude i'd ever seen in my life and i had to run and jump up the back of him and like take him down to the ground and i did it and i was so proud of myself and then they cut it and i was like come on man i think they thought I, that it was i have a fun <laughs> Jesus Rios, like that, he was the one that played the role like that. But it was funny, like that, because they were getting ready to film that that scene, like that, and that's when Chris Chulak turned around and looked at me and said, "Do you want to play this role?" Like it, you know. And I'm watching Katie slam the guy against the front of the car, and I was like, "No, no, I really, no, I don't want to do that. No." <laughs> that was the first role they offered me. I was like, "Nah, I don't think so. No." <laughs> Sorry about that moment of growling. That was Kipling, um, who is hopefully going to be quiet for the rest of the, the event. Uh, okay, this is to Lou, and this is, isn't a question. It's just somebody wanting to say something to you. It's uh, Justin Burnett, and it says, My father and I were lucky enough to visit the set in 2017 as guests of Lou. First and foremost, thank you to Lou for making that happen. It turned out to be one of the best days of my life. Katie, my dad and I still talk about that long conversation you had with us between scenes. So it's to Katie too. Um, we immediately bonded over my Springsteen shirt and our shared thyroid scars. <laughs> such an amazing day. Thank you for all, all for being such wonderful people. Lou, I will never forget what you did for us. Good luck with your new book. So that's to the two of you from Appreciate Justin. Thank you, Justin. Uh, glad we can make it happen. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's one of the things about uh, our, our cast, I, I think, is that, uh, you know, we are not inaccessible. Uh, we're, you know, all, all very real.
still very nice down to earth people and uh we've had an opportunity uh, uh here and there uh to to exhibit that which is nice I mean, it's why we're here doing this sort of thing talking to talking to fans and having a conversation you know the next one is to uh Katie and Lou, both. They want you uh, separate answers, I guess. They want you each to fit, pick your favorite uh, of the books in the Longmire series. And this comes from Sonia. Sonia Hellerman, sorry. Lou, go ahead. You've read, you've read all of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I gotta, I, I gotta say the one that immediately comes to mind and it's, you know, I mean, uh, laughed my ass off in this last one, laughed it so much at, at Junkyard Dogs. But as far as something that sort of really resonated with me and, and became a very, I, I think, uh, important touchstone for me in, in the character in the series and something that nobody would ever really know unless they'd read the books uh, was uh, uh, Another Man's Moccasins oh. and how Craig goes back in time and, and, and tells us about their experiences in Vietnam and uh, what they did and what they lived through there. And there's, there is such a poignant nostalgia to that, uh, that, that um, I don't know, just really touches me. The humanity of that entire book, I absolutely love, but also it just gave me this, this sense without, without having to swagger, you know, or be cocky that, that Henry was so freaking capable that he was a very, very quiet badass. He is not somebody you ever wanted to mess with. And we never, and, and you never had to, you never had to, you know, walk around, you know, all chest puffed to, to carry that off. It was, it was a much, it was a much more uh, Zen approach to that. And that, and that is, I think, the introduction of who he is uh, as an assassin in, in that book. Very good. I like that one too. I like all of them. Katie. Yeah. Um, so I am bad in the sense that I have read, I do not know the names of them, um, but I remember reading one of the books and being like, where is Vic? Like, I don't understand what's happening. And then Lou had me read one of the books where Vic was very heavy in it. And so I read a lot of that. And then honestly, like, I just don't, I listen to books on tape, you guys. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I don't, wrong a lot that. Of books. don't apologize. I listen to books when I, when I work out, it's what I do. I go for runs and I listen to books. So I am, that was the one question that I was like, oh no, they're going to ask me if I've read all the books and I'm going to let them down and then tell me I'm a terrible person. My dog's even barking at me. <laughs> No, 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 not a terrible person. And this gives me an opportunity to, to, to give a little shout out to some real neat guys from Seattle, Washington, who run Libro. Uh, and Libro is a digital audio uh, uh, company, and they partner with independent bookstores. So you can pick the bookstore in your community, or if you want to pick us, we won't complain. It's, uh, you'd go to Libro. Uh, dot fm uh, and then backslash sun river uh, books or backslash whatever independent bookstore you like and right now they have up there being featured next to last stand by craig johnson so, so there we go you can listen to them on digital uh, and they're great guys libro are your books on out audible oh yeah yeah, oh, yeah. But the difference between now I'm even a bigger asshole. Yeah. <laughs> the difference between Audible and Libro is that Libro is uh, is uh, partnered with independent bookstores across right. the nation, and Audible is going to put it all right in Jeff Bezos's pocket. And I don't know that the man needs any more. <laughs> Say what that is one more time, because I'm going to go figure this out right when we're done. The name <laughs> of the other um, app, is it an app? It's uh, yeah, you get an app. It's uh, Libro.fm, and then okay. you can pick whatever bookstore you want, uh, that uh, independent bookstore. Don't do Libro.com, uh, .amazon, you'd throw them completely off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's see. Uh, so Katie and Lou, they want to know, and this is from Molly, uh, do you have a favorite scene that you shot, a scene that you enjoyed the most? Mm. Ladies first. I don't know. I don't know. You know, there's so many scenes between Walt and Vic before the end where 
they were so, um, it was so obvious that they loved each other and like were so, um, and it was like a real love in a sense that, that they, they protected each other and cared for each other and looked out for each other. And, 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 um, I loved all of those scenes because we were playing something that was so unspoken up till that point. And, and I adored all those scenes, but to break it down into one scene is just, I don't think I can do that. It's a good no. answer. I like that answer. No, it's, uh, no I, I, I'll say that as well. I mean, you know, first, first of all, we had a wealth of riches. We had so much good material. Uh, and uh, obviously the relationship with, with Henry and Walt was, uh, for a man, you know, uh, of our age, uh, is a very lovely thing to play, a wonderful thing to play, and and and, and uh, something that needs to be out there in the world more, you know. Uh, a lot of Henry's, you know, native storylines, especially the one with uh, Julia Jones uh, playing Gab, uh, uh, that introduces to Tantu Cardinal as well. You know, I thought I thought that 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 was a real, and and it you know echoes what you know is coming up in Craig's book a little bit, you know, as well the plight of of native women on the res. Uh, but I think early on, as far as far as where I, where I knew I was going to love playing this relationship, was the uh, the scene in the rodeo episode where I get to, I get to zap Taylor with a cattle prod. Uh, that, that that was that was fun. That was hard to keep a straight face. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I grew up on the farm. I know those cattle prods. Yeah, right. And 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 and, and the beauty of it was was. Uh, uh, there might have been another Chulak episode. Uh, the beauty of it was that he made Taylor do it so many times. <laughs> and I got this, because he wanted to, he didn't know what was going to be funniest. So, you know, the, he didn't know if, if the take was going to be, oh, and then just have him out. Or have him go, <laughs> <laughs> so we did the whole gamut of getting shock reactions, which uh, tickled the crap out of me. <laughs> That's a good one, too. Okay. <laughs> now, one scene I remember, like it was, uh, the one where Katie shows up at the cabin with a six pack of beer and opens the door and it's the wrong guy who opens the door like that. And I, I thought that scene was absolutely hilarious. Like that, cause both of you are extraordinary comedic actors. Like that, And I don't think either of you have been, have been given enough opportunity to take advantage of that. Like that. I mean, you know, that was one of the things that like we had a lot, I had a lot more time for in the books was humor. Um, just simply because, you know, the nature of the beast, you know, if you've got 330 pages versus 45 pages, like in, you know, single space, you know, I mean, you know, we were forced, especially in those first three years to really be focused on the plot, you know, and there really wasn't a lot of like extraneous, you know, uh, opportunities there. But boy, when you guys had the opportunity, you took full advantage, look at it, and uh, it was fantastic to watch. So that, those were my favorites, when you guys would sneak the humor in like that, you know, even when, it, even when maybe the, the writing wasn't there you would still sneak humor in like that. And those were beautiful. I loved the plain Vic's physical comedy because there were times when she would like clump away <laughs> and just shake her butt. And it said so much about how she felt. And I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I loved it. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> okay, from Susan uh, Roadbush, uh, this one is perhaps for all of you. It says, uh, I, I don't know which one of you is going to know this. Uh, were the red kayaks that floated by uh, the sheriff as he dug through silt in the river, were they actors and part of your, your group or were they dive bombers to the set? <laughs> uh, Anyone no, know? They were, they were cast. Okay. They, yeah, no, they, they, they were background cast. Uh, there, there is very, very little that is uh, uh, unplanned or accidental on a film set. You know, you, you, we, got, we got all our PAs uh, around the perimeters of stuff and, uh, you know, th things don't go drifting in, Espe especially, you know, if you're working around rivers or, or highways or anything else like that. I mean, the actors, uh, you can't just have stuff coming up, coming up on people. So uh, yeah, no, that was, that was uh, very much a, a, a design element. Uh, very good. So uh, this one, you remember these guys, Craig, the Red Pony Club. Uh, this is coming from Nita Slater of the Red Pony Club. Uh, and it's for Craig, Lou, and Katie. And she asks how each of you have dealt with uh, being in COVID lockdown. 
Oh, I'm sure you guys' answers are going to be infinitely more interesting than mine. So you guys go ahead. Lou. I wrote a book. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to my world. I guess. Yeah, I know. I mean, it saved my life. Are you kidding me? I mean, I, we were literally, but once, once the book sold and I knew it was going to get uh, published, which was last November, uh, we were still filming, and I would literally take a notepad and my computer. The computer stayed in the dressing room. The notepad went with me to the set, and you know, between setups and stuff, I go, oh, oh, okay, you know, and then, you know, so so uh, the final edit uh, happened uh, during that period. But then when we when we got the rug pulled out from under us in March, uh, it literally gave me a couple of months to just hunker down and uh, really really focus on some fine tuning, which which I was uh, very appreciative of. And, you know, our daughter, Indigo, who's with us here in New York, she's homeschooled anyway. So our, our routine uh, doesn't change, a, didn't change a whole lot. We just went out to dinner far less. As a matter of fact, we didn't go once. We haven't been out to dinner since March, you know. So, yeah. Um, I um, stayed up in Canada because we were filming as well. Um, and our house was under construction anyway, so it sort of worked out perfectly in the sense that we couldn't go home anyway. Um, but I, I got engaged, um, which was fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, and really just sort of, you know, not didn't do much, didn't do much at all. Like we, my fiance and I, um, sold a couple scripts to Hallmark, so Hallmark Christmas movies, um, which, because I'm a huge sucker for Hallmark Christmas movies. <laughs> I love them. Um, and we sold two scripts to them, so we really spent the entire time just getting those, those scripts written. Um, and that's pretty much it. You know, we worked on our YouTube channel and did that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, it really just ate a lot of good food that we cooked and drank a little too much. And then when we finally got the green light to go back to work, I was like, oh my God, I've gained like 10 pounds. <laughs> and I had to like lose it all over again. So yeah, so I ate a lot. My, my life hasn't changed. I, I, you know, whenever everybody went into quarantine, I was like, this is the way I've been living for the last 16 years. Like, uh, you know, uh, other than the tours, like, uh, you know, because I mean, you know, the nearest town to my ranch is a population of 25. Like, and so, you know, I sometimes make the run into Buffalo, which has a population of you know, under 5,000. Like, and so, you know, I, I, it really hasn't changed all that much. Like, and I still sit in a room by myself typing about my imaginary friends. And uh, <laughs> you know, it, uh, it's, it's what I do. Like, and uh, I do miss the tour, though. I do miss the tour. I do miss being out on the road. I miss, you know, shaking hands with folks and, you know, and doing the, uh, the performances, the events and everything, because I really enjoy them. I mean, you know, you can tell very quickly um, when you're at a book event if an author really doesn't want to be there. You know, we've all been in those book events. Like it, and, uh, you know, I, I imagine it's probably the same as like when you do a press junket, you know, for a film or for a TV show or something. There are some actors who really just don't want to do that stuff like that. And it's painful. Like it's painful to, to have to witness that type of thing. Like it, and so, you know, but I, I like it. I enjoy it. I like meeting folks. I like signing the books and I'll be back on the road again next year by golly i promise that's one thing about you craig you stay there at our store i can remember the one night you said you were driving back to portland for a uh an interview in the morning and you stayed there signing books we had that line that went all the way around the shark center <laughs> i i think you left it was like 10 10 30 and they were locking the building <laughs> Yeah, everybody was kind of concerned. They were like, well, you do know there's animals between here, you know, in Portland, right? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I live in Wyoming. There's animals everywhere. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we, we made it. We made it safe and sound like that. But it's, uh, that's, you know, that's, uh, that's important, I think. Okay? And I know that, that these guys feel exactly the same way. You know, for me, you know, when somebody lays down $28, like for a book, every year that's a contract that's a contract that i'm making with them and you know i need to come through on that contract i need to do the very best book that i can possibly do and then you know promote that book the best i can possibly do it and i'm sure it's the same you know when when these guys do a film or they do a television show they feel strongly about it's easier when it's something that you enjoy you know i think that that that's the big element there like if it's something that you really enjoy putting your heart into look at then and there's never enough like that and so we're, we're all looking forward to the point and being able to get back, you know, back on the track again. 
Okay, so the next one I think is for Craig and, and I'm a, a wee bit confused on the question because I don't know what the, when you read uh, Next to Last Stand, it isn't just Custer that you go talking about. We've got a little bit of Van Gogh going on in there. We've got Bobby <laughs> Fuller. Uh, so there, there are a few other elements that Brent come in and she asks, what books that you, this is Kathleen asking, what books that you researched would you recommend? Oh my gosh, like it, there's so many. Um, there are just so many. Like it, but um, we're kind of fortunate, like in, in the point that, like, you know, in the last, say, 10 or 20 years, um, a remarkable number of authors have come up, like it, for nonfiction, you should do historical research. Like it, uh, the one I, I laugh about the most is uh, Nathaniel Philbrick. Um, who wrote uh, The Last Stand. Like, and I was fortunate enough to do the Nantucket Book Festival and got to meet him. And at that point in time, I'd read the book and I went over to him and I said, you know, hey, you know, I just really wanted to tell you how much, you know, I really enjoyed the scope, you know, of, of, of The Last Stand. You know, the fact that you were able to include all the detail like that, but still keep it, you know, with a large enough scope to where you could really understand what had happened and how that battle had taken place. And, and he looked at me and said, well, thank you so much. Like, to be honest, I... I'm, I have to tell you that, you know, I, I watch Longmire whenever I'm working out. So it's nice that we have a reciprocal, you know, kind of relationship here like that. And so, uh, but that's a, a really wonderful book for anybody who's looking for, you know, a, an overview um, of what actually happened and also the honesty, the truth of like what actually happened and the details of what happened up until like, you know, I guess the research has been done when there, were, there was a fire up at the Little Bighorn like that. And they went back through, you know, with the metal detectors for the first time ever and um, discovered a lot of the things, the premises that had been, um, you know, thought to be true, like that about the battle, were not particularly like it. And then a lot of details that came out later, like it. Another one was uh, James Donovan's A Terrible Glory, which is a marvelous, marvelous book, maybe a little bit more detail like that. But then the ones that I really loved were like James Welch's Killing Custer, which is an absolutely magnificent book. Like it, um, of course, everything James Welch wrote is absolutely magnificent, you know I mean? You know, I'm always, you know, the, the quote that I always remember is uh, the one about George Bernard Shaw. When asked about Shakespeare, he always said, yeah, he's so good, you want to dig him up and throw rocks at him. Like, well, I feel the same way about James Welch. Like, you know, same thing. Like, but then there were a number of anthologies that I read uh, that were um, actually uh, transcribed oral histories, you know, from, you know, Northern Cheyenne and Lakota. Uh, warriors like that who had fought in the battle like that, that were transcribed maybe 10 15 20 years after the battle and these were guys that fought in that battle that were 14 years old you know they were very very young and uh, so for me it was a real opportunity to to hear some of those and then of course you know going up on the res like that and uh, sitting down with my buddy charles little old man like that and hearing his story about his grandfather you know fighting in the battle for goodness sake like that and you know to hear those stories you know that they're you know straight from the you know from the mouth you know of the ancestors of the people that were involved those were absolutely magnificent and then you know i mean that, that that was the fun part that was the fun part you know kind of like discovering the realities of it like that and uh and 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 the knowledgeability that this was not two two uh armies fighting on some battlefield this was an expeditionary force that was harassing like at a nomadic people like at, that were you know, trying to, you know, work their way across like that and still attempting to be a nomadic people like that. And uh, it put them at a, something of a disadvantage like that because there they are 10,000 of them, you know, and it wasn't just warriors like it, it was, you know, these warriors, it was the, it was the women, the children, the elderly, like at the infirm, everybody. And I think Lou heard me talking about this before, like it, in the sense that, you know, they, it, it put them at a dreadful imposition like it, to have their back against the wall, like it, to try and defend their loved ones. But then again, it also can make for a very motivated fighting force. When your loved ones are behind you, there's nowhere to go. And you're gonna fight, you know, as hard as you can possibly fight like that. And uh, I think the 7th Cavalry kind of, you know, took that one on the chin simply because of that simple factor, so. Very good, okay, so let's see. More of these, we got lots. <laughs> Okay, uh, this is also from Kathleen, same uh, person as the last one. And I'm, I'm pretty sure she's talking about Craig because the question is if you'd be willing to take a small part in a future movie or episode. And we already know that, that Lou and Katie, uh, pretty much that's their life. So it's gotta be you, Craig. Uh, I did my one cameo role uh, in, in Longmire. And um, 
I was horrible. I was really, really bad. Like, and so, and it wasn't, it, it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't made any easier by the fact that Robert Taylor was the one that I had to sit across the table, you know, from and, and try and remember like that, you know, what it was that I was supposed to do. And uh, it, it's, you know, it, it gave me a, 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 a wonderful respect um, for what these guys do like that, because I mean, in, in some ways, it was kind of like how I described the battle there. You think you're going to be there alone like that, you know, and you'll be able to concentrate. No, there are like, you know, 50 people surrounding you that are like touching up your nose like that and, you know, you're fixing your hair and making sure the glass is in the same place that it was in the last take and all this kind of stuff. It's all very distracting like that and uh, very difficult to try and like, you know, keep any kind of focus there. So uh, my kudos, you know, to, to those who do it for a living like that because it's a whole heck of a lot harder than you might think like that and uh, future acting enterprises no none whatsoever <laughs> not likely ain't gonna happen like that so there <laughs> okay so, uh holly hess uh from uh florida and montana asks katie how do you feel about the last episode is that the ending you anticipated um i actually thought that it was beautiful the, the way that it was done um what I loved about um, that coming together, those two characters, for me playing Vic, um, it's sort of where I wanted her to be at the end, you know, um, this sort of, this love and this sort of admiration that she had for this man. And, and there was so much truth in, in, in that. And the scenes with Rob, just that, the, we had, I mean, it's so hard to talk about it because it's a sex scene, but um, there was so much respect in that scene um, as actors, but also as these two characters. And I, I loved that even after you saw the love, there was no completion to it. There was no, oh, okay, so now they're together. There was none of that. It was just it happened and now let's get back to our lives and and I love that conversation that they're having you know on his front porch because you don't know what's going to happen next it's sort of like well what do you do now you know um and I loved that I loved that it allowed the audience to sort of think about it and have their own ending for the two of them I like to think it was her who called him on his cell phone <laughs> at the end but you never know okay very good uh so uh, one from Meg that I think I can ans answer partially. It says, Meg asks, when will the audio be out? We pre-ordered and are still waiting with bated breath. Uh, a, didn't pre-order for me, so I can't answer on that completely. But I can say that it is out on Libro.fm uh, 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 right now. So you can get it digitally that way right now. And uh, Craig, do you know whether the audio has, uh, the CDs have released yet? I'm pretty sure like that they usually go out, um, if not the day of, like at the day following like that. And, uh, you know, I know that, you know, George Woodall, like I did all the research and, you know, and, and all the conversations with me and everything like that, you know, months ago. Generally, they come out about the same day as the, as the regular book. I, I just checked the uh, uh, distributor's warehouse on that question for somebody who is ordering from us yesterday and they weren't yet in the, uh, in, in the warehouses. So I, I don't know on the CDs, but, but Meg, if they're not there now, they will be very, very shortly. Yes. Uh, and you can get it right now on libro.fm, uh, uh, whatever bookstore you want it to be. Um, okay, uh, Molly, who's heard this apparently from you before, Oh, no, he's, oh, this is going to be an interesting one. Molly uh, has heard you talk about Rob's uh, um, addition. And, uh, and Judy had some interesting comments on that, too, if I remember right. Um, but she wants to know uh, what you thought of uh, Katie and Lou's additions. Oh, my gosh. I mean, you know, that, that, there really wasn't any question like that when you, you know, they, they, they sent me the CD or the DVDs and each one of the DVDs had a couple of different, you know, people, you know, auditioning. And, you know, I, if you, if you pressed me, I would not even be able to tell you who the other people that auditioned for their roles were. 
um, they, they, they didn't stick. They didn't stick. Like, and so I was kind of tickled to death. I, I tried to keep my mouth shut like that, but uh, every single person like that, that I was rooting for like that, you know, through the audition practice um, got the roles like that. And so I, I, you know, for me, it was very, very easy. Like yeah, their, their, their performances were fantastic. So. Okay. I remember my audition though. It was quite, quite funny. Um, I went in to read and I, I got this very short scene. It was like two pages. And I was like, all right. I mean, I guess they're going to decide off two pages. So I went in and Greer was there and, and, um, um, Chulak was there and, and Hunt was there and, and John, and they were all there. And I did my audition and I left, like, it was really good two page audition. And Jessica Greer's assistant comes running after me. I'm already back to the parking lot. And she goes, Katie, they loved what you did. And I was like, well, that's weird. I've never been chased down in a parking lot. And she was like, they would love for you to come back and finish the scene. <laughs> what? It was like eight pages and I'd only gotten two. <laughs> so I went back and I like, ad-libbed the rest of the pages and just sort of went for it. <laughs> they must have been so confused because I like must have mic dropped and walked out. I must have been like, done. Nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm out of here. That's, that's all they need to see. That's funny. And I, it's, it's funny because I, I wanted, uh, um, the one thing I remember from my audition was that, uh, um, Junie Lowry uh, was the casting director, and Junie Lowry is is the woman who found me for Love Amba. So two of yeah, hundred percent, she found me in Dallas, Texas. So two of the uh, the highlights of my career, uh, I, I owe to that woman. So uh, uh, and it was so funny because I, I think she really wanted me to get it, uh, so much so that she couldn't attend the audition. She she ducked out the back and just, no, I can't, I can't watch, I can't watch, you know. So. <laughs> So next question is for you also, Lou. So, uh, and I love La Bamba. I think everybody did. So great movie. Uh, it says, question for Lou. Uh, this comes from Diana. Many moons ago, I remember a young Mr. Phillips doing a film based on a book from the late, great Tony Hillerman. How do you compare your experiences then and now? And a second question in relation to the current one. In the books, Henry was a special forces soldier in Vietnam. Do you take that into account when acting the character at all? I remember one episode where Henry was taken hostage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I answered part of that earlier about, uh, you know, the uh, Another Man's Moccasins. And that's kind of, you know, Meryl Streep used to say that she has this, you know, uh, a secret, you know, about her character that she never tells anybody. And, and in moments of self-reflection or between lines, you go to that secret. And that's something that, you know, you, you carry with you. Uh, that that informs your inner life. Uh, that that was that was Henry's, you know, his military background. Uh, he, you know, we uh, we put military stuff, we put patriotic stuff, we put native stuff all over the office, all over the red pony. Uh, uh, so you got the you got the uh, idea that you know this was a part of his world. Um, the other part of that question was, oh, uh, yeah, and it's funny because Craig, you made me think of this. Uh, I, uh, first of all, I really wish I could have played Jim Chi more. We were supposed to. Uh, Fred Ward and I were supposed to do three films. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the biggest problem was that the, the produ production company kind of went bankrupt. So they put all their money into uh, Cliffhanger, the Stallone movie, and they didn't promote The Dark Wind at all. So as a result, uh, uh, the film did not do well. It's, it's still a lovely, lovely film. I'm actually quite proud of it. Um, but, uh, you know, Redford was supposed to direct the second one. We were supposed to do A Thief of Time and then Skinwalkers. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, we had been contracted to do all three, uh, but uh, never got a chance to do the other two. But what was funny is that Tony Hillerman, uh, number, first of all, this is back in the day when we used to do uh, dailies, you know, in, in a high school auditorium, we would do dailies and the whole crew would show up because we were in Tuba City, Arizona with not a lot more to do. So... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and it was and it's a dry county on the rest. So you know, <laughs> yeah, a lot, of, a lot of Dr. Pepper and dailies. So uh, um, Tony used to come and, and watch the dailies with us, and uh, he said one of the nicest things. He goes, he goes, yeah, you know, 
your face is very close to one of the original, uh, uh, you know, renderings of, of uh, Jim Chi in my novel. So uh, when they cast you, I, I wasn't, uh, you know, surprised at all. Uh, and then he had a scene that he did with me, and this was in the uh, uh, in a prison, and it was like a two-page scene. It was like a two-page scene, and as the time goes by, and and God God love him, and Tony can't deliver a full sentence, and and he can't stop glancing at the camera and he can't and it just it just stymied him and craig saw a picture of him on the set where he's, he's literally looking like he's been stuffed you know <laughs> and eventually the scene came down to him i think maybe giving a couple of monosyllabic you know answers like, yes he's here okay and that was you know, the, end of the scene because eventually it just it just uh, it just didn't fly and uh he uh he learned the he learned the uh, lesson that, that Craig uh, seemed to intuit long before he had to go through it. <laughs> okay, so, shall we do a couple more? And then we're over an hour now, so I, I thought maybe go to your clip. So maybe three more questions and then clip. What do sure. you think? Sure. Does that sound good? Or I'm assuming you don't want to do, let me see how many more we have to go. Somewhere around 150. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, I, uh, 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 I can stick around. And, These poor guys might have a life. Like, you know, so. Three more and then we'll go to the clip because then it won't matter if we lose me because it'll be the clip. Okay. Um, so uh, the next is for Katie and Lou. Is there a particular book that you would like to see filmed? One book that you said, I want to act in that story from, from Craig's uh, Longmire series. And who I, I should give you have, the... I always, yeah, I always wanted to see Vic go back to Philadelphia. And yeah, I was going to say, you would have to go with Kindness Goes Unpunished like that. That's because the one with the sex scene. Vic's whole family. I know. And, and there's the sex scene, yeah. Look at <laughs> Vic moment. Well done, Katie. Uh, wow, 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 wow. I mean, there's so many. I mean, there's there's so many that ha that have such beautiful Henry moments. I mean, the one where he, you know uh, uh, marries Katie. That that that's that's a fantastic. With as the pro flies. Yep. That one's pretty that fantastic. Um, and then I mean, just I mean, just from a sheer cinematic. Uh, Point of view, and it's a great one for Vic too. Uh, the the one set in Sturgis, uh, is, obvious is, fact. Yeah. yeah, an obvious fact uh, is is very clever and very cool and uh, uh, very cinematic. So yeah, that there's a actually uh, the, there's a, a in, in this particular book like that there's a a frightening revelation like that that uh, Vic has been wanting a new truck like that for you know about eight uh -huh. years now like that and. Uh, Walt finally breaks down and lets her buy this like 500 horsepower, you know, four wheel drive, dual turbocharged. You know, he calls it the Banshee is what he calls it like that. And uh, so every time that they start walking towards the truck, she turns and looks at him and says, stop making that face. And he's like, I'm going to die. And I want to like, you know, I can't help it. You know, it's, it's just something that happens whenever I go towards the truck. Like that. So this one, I, could this easily, I could easily see Katie driving that truck. No problem at all. <laughs> so <laughs> should get to drive something pretty impressive and obvious fact too. True. Yes, she does. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that question was from Troop. So we said three, so two more. Uh, yeah, troop. And there's a from uh, Donna Rolug. I just want to tell you, tell you all, thank you. Great to see and hear all of you. Amazing talent and amazing people. You've all become like extended family. Can't wait to hear what you have to say. Craig and Judy, you have made all this possible. And what don't these networks get about how much everyone loves Longmire, Longmire, a force to be reckoned with, thank you. So I guess that one's not a question, but a big thank you. Um, Craig, for you, from Jeanette Townsend, do you keep in contact with the sheriff who you first interviewed when you were starting to write the series? What feedback do you get from real life sheriffs about the series? Oh, uh, they, they, they uh, yeah, I do, I do. I, I have a, a cadre of, of sheriffs, like at a varying ages and degrees of experience from varying 
uh, counties like that because you know each county is is very different from any other like that and uh, it's fortunate like that because you know with the the success of the books and the TV show they're they're a little more open like that to talk with me about uh, you know what it is they do and how they do it like that um, you know they they uh, most of them like that you know I mean uh, the, the response that you get is that they're happy that you know the things that Walt does in the books, you know, he, he's dealing with the things that they normally deal with. Um, they, they do like to have the opportunity of, um, you know, they, they would like to do some of the things that Walt does, but they're afraid that they might get into a little bit of trouble every once in a while like that. But uh, the one thing they really enjoy, it seems like, is uh, when Walt doesn't have to really resort to violence, like that he can use his brain, you know, to kind of, uh, you know, dampen down situations like that and make situations a little more palatable for everybody like that. and. Uh, you know, that, that he's not a boob, you know, that he, just because he's a rural sheriff, you know, doesn't mean that he's a boob, but like that he's, you know, he's a very well read and intelligent and insightful individual like that and uh, very capable in what it is that he does like that. And uh, I got uh, invited to go to the National Sheriff's Association meetings like that and speak there. And, uh, you know, it was remarkable like that to see, you know, what these guys do and uh, how hard they work at it. Like it's a very, very personal, very local, you know, form of law enforcement. I mean, people who would walk in like that and uh, and dress down a sheriff, you know, would never walk into a police office in their lives, you know, like that. So they feel like that there's an investment there. If they they gave a vote, you know, to uh, a sheriff like that, that's a sacred trust. It's kind of like, you know, if they pay to go see a movie like that or, or invest in seeing a television show like that or buy a book like that, that's a contract is what that is. Like that. And, uh, you know, there are those of us who take it very, very seriously. Okay, and then I had one up. I, I just lost the question. Oh, this is again not a question, so I'll give you one more question after this. But this is from Mary Williams. She says, Really, not a question. So that's how I knew. I, I just want to say, because of you wonderful people, it makes reading the book so much more fun. I can see all of you in the characters. Thank you. So that was to you, uh, Lou and Katie. Um, and then one more question, and then we've done it. Okay, from Ronald Mills uh, for Craig. Steamboat is my favorite novel you've written. Where did you get your inspiration? And before you go to that, Craig, email me. I have got an idea for Steamboat and Christmas this year. So uh, you and I will talk later. But okay. where did you get okay. your in inspiration? Um, a good friend of ours, like at her father, was actually one of the Doolittle Raiders. Like at, and uh, so when I was comprising the character of Lucian like that, I thought, okay, yeah, that would be interesting, like an interesting background for him to have. Like, and I, uh, I, I, I guess, you know, um, you know, I, I wanted to see Lucian back in the seat of a B-25. I wanted to see what would happen like that. And then also, you know, deal with the issues like that of him, like, you know, having fought during World War II and, uh, you know, doing the raid on Tokyo and that, you know, that this was a little girl like that who had been, you know, involved in a car accident up in Billings. Montana like that and uh, had burns over you know percentage of her body and you know needed to get you know to Denver to the children's hospital like that and there was only one plane that could do it and only one guy that could fly like it and certainly only one guy that could talk him into it you know and that had to be Walt like it and uh, it was uh, it was a it was a it was a fun book to write it was uh, I knew it wasn't going to be a full length book um, I knew it was going to be a novella um, you know, you get a feel, you know, for, you know, the length of books after a while like that, you know, you know, if a story like that is a 330 page story or a 150 page story like that. And I didn't want to pad that one out. I just wanted to, to tell it like it was like that. And uh, it was a joy. It was a joy to write. So thank you. You know, all your books send me down a rabbit hole. And this one sent me down a rabbit hole of looking up everything that happened to that amazing horse. <laughs> there are reams of information about the horse Steamboat. Um, so y'all can Google it. A fascinating horse, but you got to read Steamboat first. Yeah. Uh, so um, we will now be going to a video clip. But before we go there, I just want to tell Katie and Lou, I'm just thrilled that you could join us. Thank you so much for coming to Sun River Books and Music via the virtual event. And Lou, you got my email. If you want to do this again with us when your book comes out, you email me and we'll make it happen. Sounds great. Uh, Craig, you know you're my favorite cowboy, right? Thank you, dear. Always Thank will you. be. Always will be. <laughs> Thank uh, you, Katie. Thank you, Lou. Thank you guys so much. So great to see you, Katie. It's so great to see you.
And for all of you that have not bought Next to Last Stand, this is the time to go buy that book and put this man on the New York Times bestsellers list because that is where he belongs. And just as a little carrot, we, re we hear a lot right now about law enforcement in the news and clearly changes need to happen. Uh, but Walt uh, Longmire is written by a man who knows what a police officer should be. Read page 79. So there's a little carrot for you. And you'll see just what I mean in uh, Next to Last Stand. So now let's see uh, if I screw up going to this video. And Craig, also, there's supposed to be a video of Wyoming that Penguin said you were making. Mm, not that I'm aware of, no. <laughs> no. Okie doke. Um, you and I can talk about that one later, too. Okay. Then. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go to the one we've got. And uh, again, Lou and Katie, many, many thanks. Craig, many thanks. And we're heading now yeah. to the reading. Craig, you want to say anything about the reading before we go? No, I think it'll stand on its own. Like it's the, the lovely Zahn McLaren and like that uh, live, you know, from the Little Big One Battlefield. Okie doke. So thank you all for being with us. Sorry we couldn't answer all the questions. Hope you enjoyed the ones that were answered. Bits of ribbon fluttered from the budding branches of a stunted juniper. The National Forest Service having decided to allow the dancing prayer flags to have their day and every other since 1876. We don't know. We just come by here and there's another one tied to the branches. Hundreds of them, actually. She leaned out of the window of one of those elaborate golf carts the park rangers used to patrol the battlefield. The Indians aren't as bad as the tourists. There was a man who wanted to know why we didn't plant grass and water the hill, since it was a gray site after all. I guess they missed the point. The older woman poked her smoky bear hat back under several locks. Sand, rocks, and sagebrush. That's the way it was when they died, and it's the way it should stay. I swear if they had their druthers, there'd be beer and hot dog stands and souvenir shops right here on the hill. The history books say that there were no survivors at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. But there were thousands, thousands who waited after the battle for the other cavalry boot to drop. The combined nations of the Lakota and the Cheyenne, and even the five Arapaho who had fought, knew that a retribution was coming. They just didn't know when. Vic slipped her thumbs into the back pockets of her jeans and looked down the ridge that had carried the seventh to their doom. I can't believe I've lived here all these years and never been here. I mean, I saw it from the highway, but here it's, it's different. I waved goodbye to the ranger and regarded the prayer tree one last time before stepping up with my friends. In what way? Haunted. It was a difficult statement to argue with, standing there above the winding river with the trees that had witnessed the battle in the mountains, our mountains, strung along the horizon, scraping the afternoon sky raw. Private Charles Wendolf, Vic looked back at me. He one of those markers down there? Nope, but he said that what he saw here would haunt him to his grave. Men staggering around in circles, confused and bleeding, wandering through the broken skirmish line at the ridge that looked down at the blood-stained grass and the waves of heat that distorted the vision of dying men who lay there screaming for water while others farther down the slope were being hacked to bits by Lakota and the Cheyenne warriors. This Windolf guy, he was here? Yep. It arrived in New York six years previously, had left Germany to avoid getting conscripted in the Franco-Prussian War, but he couldn't get a job, mostly because he couldn't speak English, 
and so he figured a great way to learn the language might be to join the army. Faulty logic. He was with Colonel Benteen, Company H, up here farther down the ridge, and he got a Medal of Honor for providing cover fire for the men who were attempting to get water. Vic kneeled and plucked a piece of grass from the hillside and placed the stem into her mouth. He survived till 1950, buried over in the Black Hills. Well, I thought there weren't any survivors. The Cheyenne Nation shook his head, turned, and walked past us. None of Custard's personal command survived. We watched as he continued across the roadway, dodging the tourist buses and quietly unaware of the looks he was receiving from the many tourists who were probably sure they were seeing the living embodiment of Crazy Horse or a distant relative of Sitting Bull. He gets emotional up here. She smiled a sad smile. I can understand that. His people may have won the battle, but in the end, they lost the war. Nomadic tribes with nowhere to be nomads. We eventually followed Henry and entered a walkway on the other side where a large mound of earth rose up with the memorial to Wooden Leg, the unknown warrior, with red dirt at its center and wall panels for each of the tribes that fought there and above them the outlines of the spirit warriors who stretched horizontally, ghostly figures. The bear stood there, looking through them at the high plain sky, taut and threadbare blue. A few people walked around the place, giving him room. Many Cheyenne children were born on the trail north from out of imprisonment in Oklahoma, Women would fall back in the hollows or clumps of sage to give birth to children whose mouths and noses were held shut to keep them from crying as the long knives. Calvary, I interpreted. The bear nodded and continued. Wood ride passed, then the women carrying their children would sneak through them in the night to rejoin the tribe. These children would learn the most important Cheyenne virtue first, Silence. He smiled back at us. There is a saying among my people that none are truly defeated until the hearts of their women are on the ground. Vic attempted to get the chronology straight. This is before the battle? Yes, there were many things that led to this travesty, including the Battle of Washita River, where Custer took his Cheyenne wife. She turned to look at him. You mentioned that back at the bar. Mona Sita, the 15-year-old daughter of Little Rock. After the battle in Oklahoma, some 53 women and children were used as human shields and then taken captive by the 7th Calvary. By all accounts, the young woman was beautiful and Custer took her as her own. According to Benteen, chief of scouts Ben Clark in the histories of my people, she bore him a son. Holy crap. There's some conjecture about that. They both looked at me. Custer contracted syphilis while at West Point, which evidently left him sterile, leading some to believe that it was his brother, Thomas, who impregnated the girl. These guys were real charmers, huh? Henry shrugged. A Custer is a Custer. She stared up at the sculpture and the skeletal figures on horseback. Do you think they knew who was attacking them? The bear shook his head. No, I think not. They simply knew that they were being attacked and that they needed to protect the women, children, and the aged. They didn't know that they killed Custard? Eventually. He glanced back at me, turned to look at her. Do you know what the winter count is? No. It is a pictorial account of a tribe's achievements painted on an animal hide, a sort of annual calendar of events of any great importance to the Cheyenne. So, the Battle of Greasy Grass appears in none of them. For my people, it was a skirmish and a disorderly one at that. 
Watching his eyes, I saw them travel past Vic and me. Turning, we found about 120 people standing behind us with their sunglasses and ball caps, the tour buses having just disgorged their content. Everyone was silent, held in thrall as they recorded the bear on their cell phones, held aloft. The Cheyenne Nation nodded solemnly and raised his hands. The next show is at 2 o'clock. 